Open your Bibles, please, to 1 Peter chapter 1. We're going to be reading in just a few minutes from uh, verses 22 through the end of the chapter, which is verse 25. Before we do that, a couple things I want to bring to your attention. Um, this coming week, I have a, a week of vacation scheduled, and I'll be taking that week off. So Chad will be bringing a, a sermon for you next week. And so I pray that you'll keep him in, in your prayers as he gets ready for that. And then on Sunday, May the 3rd, that's uh, two Sundays from now, we're going to try a church-wide Zoom worship service. And the way that's going to work is we will send out um, in the days before the service um, an invitation via email. You'll need that to, you need to keep that email so that um, you can connect to the Zoom site and access the uh, worship service. Now, you will need to have the Zoom app on your computer or your tablet or your smartphone, but it's free. There's no cost to doing that. There's no cost to you for participating in the, the worship service. But we hope to have the whole church together for that, and I pray that you'll be able to participate. Uh, one last thing, please continue to make those phone calls, text messages, emails, Zoom, FaceTime, whatever, in order to uh, keep up with everybody at church, especially your Sunday school class and others that you um, work with here at the church. It's very important we uh, keep up with each other. All right, I hope you have a copy of God's Word with you, and let's read together from 1 Peter chapter 1 beginning in verse 22 to the end of the chapter. Since you have purified yourself by your obedience to the truth, so that you show sincere brotherly love for each other, from a pure heart love one another constantly, because you have been born again, not of perishable seed, but of imperishable, through the living and enduring word of God. For all flesh is like grass, and all its glory like a flower of the grass. The grass withers, and the flower falls, but the word of the Lord endures forever. And this word is the gospel that, we, that was proclaimed to you. Let's begin with a word of prayer. Father, we come before you, and we ask that you be our teacher during this, this lesson time. Father, we thank you for the word of God that is eternal and true. And we pray, Lord, that you would take this passage and mold us and shape us by it so that we might be more like our Lord Jesus Christ in all ways. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. In the years of the Jewish exile in Babylon, God raised up a beautiful young lady by the name of Esther to become queen of Persia. In those days, an evil man by the name of Haman plotted to wipe out all of the Jews. Queen Esther's uncle was a wise man named Mordecai. And when Esther um, hesitated to approach the king in order to save her people, Mordecai said to her, Who knows, perhaps you have come to, to your royal position for such a time as this. And to this day, Jews celebrate the Feast of Purim as a remembrance of Esther's heroic effort to save the Jews. Now, queen, as queen, Esther knew that if she entered into the king's presence without being summoned, she was literally courting death. But if she went into the king and, and he extended his gold scepter to her, then everything was fine. But if he didn't extend the scepter for whatever reason, then the queen would literally pay with her life. And of course, we know what happened. The queen approached the king and was welcomed into his presence. And shortly thereafter, the Jews um, were safe and Haman was hung on the same scaffold that he had planned to hang the Jews on. Queen Esther had risked her own life to save her people. Centuries later, Jesus suffered and died so that the world could find salvation in and through him. Why should we Christians think that we should have any, anything different than what happened to our Lord? Or consider the Apostle Paul. Consider, according to his own words in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 24 through 28, he writes this about himself. Five times I received the 40 lashes minus one from the Jews. 
Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I received a stoning. Three times I was shipwrecked. I have spent a night and a day in the open sea. On frequent journeys, I face dangers from rivers, dangers from robbers, dangers from my own people, dangers from Gentiles, dangers from in the city, dangers in the wilderness, dangers at sea, and dangers among false brothers. Toil and hardship, many sleepless nights, hunger and thirst, often without food, cold and without clothing, not to mention other things. There is the daily pressure on me, my concern for the churches. Now, if Paul, who is rightly considered the greatest of the followers of Jesus, should suffer in such ways, why should we think that we can escape suffering? Well, as you know, or as we move towards our text now, we cannot ignore the fact that Christians suffer in a key element of, excuse me, the, <laughs> Let me say that over again. I can do this. As we move towards our text now, we ignore, um, the, we cannot ignore the fact that um, suffering is an element of the Christian life. Um, we will eventually get to chapter 4 in 1 Timothy, or excuse me, 1 Peter, um, which is the key verse to this whole letter. Um, but let's back up one verse and read uh, 1 Peter 4, 12 and 13. It says this, Dear friends, don't be surprised when the fiery ordeal comes among you to test you as if something unusual were happening to you. Instead, rejoice as you share in the suffering of Christ so that you may also rejoice with great joy when his glory is revealed. Friends, many of the people around the world are suffering right now. Um, we have a stay-at-home order um, here in Maryland because of the coronavirus. And sadly, a lot of people think that's our suffering. Oh, come on, please. You know, that's nothing compared to being arrested or beaten or even killed because of your faith in Christ. Why, I am, why am I talking about suffering in a sermon that deals with holiness and love? Well, it's simple. Holiness and love do not exempt us from suffering Jesus and Paul are testimonies of this. Many of us today are suffering too. We cannot wait for our suffering to end before we learn how to put on holiness and love. We have to begin now. And if you're not going to start now, when will you start? Well, Peter begins our text in verse 22 with these words. Since you have purified yourself by your obedience to the truth, and we'll pause right there. Now, he, he makes a kind of a strange statement. He says, um, since you have purified yourself, and of course, this begs the question, who purifies who? Now, it's Jesus that purifies us. We don't purify ourselves. But what is Peter saying here? Well, if you get into the grammar of, of the, the Greek language here, uh, the words purify yourself, is in the perfect tense. And what that means is that our purification was completed in the past, but it continues into the present and the future. In other words, when we placed our faith in Jesus Christ at the cross, God forgave us of our sins, past, present, and future. Okay, it's a done deal. But that purification continues into the present and even into the future until we enter into God's glory. I also want you to notice that Peter connects our purification with our obedience. He literally writes, um, since you have purified yourself by your obedience to the truth. This means that Christians um, have been declared pure or righteous at our salvation, but we have a responsibility to continue in God's righteousness. In other words, we cannot claim faith in Jesus Christ, making him the Lord and Savior of our life, but then go back to a life of sin. All Christians continue to sin. That's, that's a matter of, of truth because the old nature is still in us. But we are not to let that old nature dominate. Um, we're not to live by the flesh. Uh, we also have a new nature, one from God. And this new nature is how we are supposed to live. This is our practice. This is our lifestyle. 
Now, how do we own God's truth? We have to accept God and, God and his word as true. You see, all actions begin in our mind. Uh, if we don't believe that God is true, if we don't believe that God's word is true, we're never going to do it. But if we accept it, then we can begin to do it. We will certainly fail. I, fa I sin every day, and every one of you listening to me does. But that's why God gives us forgiveness. We sin, we confess, we repent, and we move on in God's power. Let me give you an example of what I'm talking about from Jesus' life. In Luke chapter 2, verses 51, 52, it reads this. Then he went down with them and came to Nazareth and was obedient to them. His mother kept all these things in her heart, and Jesus increased in wisdom and in stature and in favor with God and with people. Now, this is obviously not a call for Jesus to, to live a holy life because he is alone holy. He has been, uh, he was sinless, he was perfect, um, he had nothing to repent of. But look what happens here. Jesus is a preteen when this story takes place. He's gone with his family to Jerusalem for one of the festivals, uh, Passover, I believe it was. And now he is um, promising to go back to Nazareth and be obedient to his parents. And that's the point I want us to see here. We have to be obedient to God and to God's word. And look what was the result with Jesus. It will be the same with us. Um, when Jesus was obedient to Mary and Martha, or Mary and Martha, Mary and Joseph, um, number one, he grew in wisdom. And not only he got wise, but he developed. It was a process. He he had a certain degree of of wisdom at you know one day, and as he grew in, in the knowledge of God, in the service of God, that wisdom increased, and that will also happen with us. Second thing that happened with Jesus is that he grew in stature. Now that word originally means that he got bigger. He grew up. He became a man. And that certainly is true, but I think there's more to it than just that. Because as he was obedient to, to Mary and Joseph, um, people recognized in Jesus that here is a young man that they could trust. That when they asked him to do something, he would be able to do it and carry it to completion. And that will happen, I think, also with us as we walk in obedience to God. Third thing that happened with Jesus was that he grew in favor with God, and then he grew in favor with man as well. I love this idea of the favor of God. What it means is, is that God's watching our lives. He sees every facet of our life. And when we walk in obedience, it puts joy in uh, God's heart. He smiles as he watches us. And as he watches us and smiles and takes delight in our obedience, we have the blessings of God. And certainly that was true in Jesus's life. And it will also be true in our life. One of the great things about Christianity is that Christians are not left alone to struggle through life. God walks with us and he changes us along the way. The greatest change occurs at our salvation, but God doesn't stop there. He continues to teach us and, and shape us into Christ-likeness. We have to do our part, no doubt about that, but it helps me to know that it's not up to me and it's not up to you. God is there with us to help us along the way, and when we stumble and fall as we do every day, he picks us back up we dust ourselves off with confession and repentance, and we move on. And that's a beautiful thing that God does for us. You know, loving others can be difficult, especially when we have not accepted God's call to holiness. But once we begin to put on God's holiness, we will most certainly also begin to put on God's love, and we should. Peter continued continues our text in verse 22 with these words, so that you show sincere brotherly love for each other from a pure heart, love one another constantly because you have been born again. Now, it's a very interesting in this verse. It's one of the few times in the New Testament that two forms of love are used in the same sentence. 
When Peter uses the phrase um, brotherly love, he's talking about philo, um, brotherly love, philodelphia, uh, the city of brotherly love, all right? Um, then when he uses the phrase um, pure heart, love one another, he's using the word agape. This is an unconditional kind of love. It is God's love. It's a love that you and I cannot achieve, um, but Christ can do it through us. Now, why does he do these two things? Well, I think it's a beautiful picture of um, combination of things. We are to love other people because, first, they love us. Nothing wrong with it. That's what Philo love is. I love you because I know you're going to love me back. And hopefully that goes both ways, okay? Um, but there's also some times when we have to exercise unconditional love. And that's the agape love. There are some people in the world that are just not easy to love. Doesn't matter. We have to love them anyways. Um, now, um, Peter talks about two groups here, I believe, in this, in this verse. Um, he talks about, first of all, Christians. This is the philo love. We are to love one another because our brothers and sisters in Christ love us back. And that's fine. We ought to love that way. Okay, but we also ought to love the world unconditionally. Remember that Christ loved us while we were still dead in our sins. He died on the cross for us. That is the extent of his love. And this is the kind of love that we're supposed to show other Christians, but also the world. Now, why do we do this? Why do we love others? Well, Peter answers that question by saying, because we've been born again. All right. Um, God has loved us even though we were sinners, even though we were in, we are in rebellion against him, Christ died for our sins. And that is the reason why we love others because God first loved us. Let me give you another illustration from the life of Jesus that I think might be helpful. In the uh, upper room um, prior to uh, Jesus and the disciples heading off to the um, Garden of Gethsemane, um, it says in John 15, 9 through 12, these words. This is Jesus speaking. As the Father has loved me, I, also, or I have also loved you. Remain in my love. If you keep my commands, you will remain in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commands and remain in his love. I have loved you, or excuse me, I have told you these things so that you may, uh, so that your joy may be in you and your joy may be complete. This is my command. Love one another as I have loved you. Now here Jesus commands us to love one another. Well, how do we do that? Um, remember, he's using the, ter the word agape here in this passage. All right, that's the unconditional love. A love you and I can't live up to. But he tells us, um, how we go about this. Um, we can love one another with unconditional love because we keep the commands of Christ. Uh, what are the commands of Christ? Well, just open the Bible from Genesis to Revelation. There you go. That's the commands of Christ, all right? He is God. He is the author of Scripture. And when God's Word tells us to do something, that's just as if Jesus were saying it to us. All right. So we do what God wants us to do. And as that happens in the Christian's life, we're going to be drawn closer to God. We're going to be walking closer and closer with Jesus Christ. And the result of that is Christ is going to live more and more through us. All right. Beautiful thing going on here. We walk in obedience, but it's Christ who's living through us allowing us and helping us to be obedient. And out of that obedience comes the love of Christ. Now, obviously there are some people that are just plain hard to love, but God makes it possible that you and I can do that because Christ loves us first. He remained in his father's love and we remain in his love through the same way, through obedience. How do we learn to love and Learn, unlearn how to hate? Well, we can't do it on our own. But when we learn to humble ourselves before God and to let God live through us, he will 
begin to love others through us. The first part um, of the fruit of the Spirit is love. Um, that's the agape love, the God love, the unconditional love. We're commanded to do that, to love one another unconditionally. But it's a love that requires Jesus to live through us. And this is what is happening uh, when you and I are obedient. Peter describes our call to holiness and then to love. And the apostle shares with us the guide for our journey into holiness and love. The guide is the word of God. Look again with me at verse 23. It says this, Because you have been born again, not of perishable seed, but of imperishable, through the living and enduring word of God. Well, have you ever noticed that as a Christian, the word of God has come alive to you? What this means is that the Holy Spirit dwelling in us has opened up our spirit to understand the word of God. Anybody who's literate can read the Bible. You don't have to be a Christian to read it. An atheist can read it if, if they know how to read and write, all right? But the atheist is not going to understand the word of God. You and I do because the Holy Spirit makes it real to us. Now, what we, we need to understand that the Bible is connected to God. It's God's word. It's, it's God's message to us. Now, God is alive. He is not dead. He is not distant. He is alive and with us. And consequently, the Bible is also alive. Uh, sometimes I'll sit down in my office um, on Monday morning and I'll look at a passage of scripture that I'm supposed to preach on the following Sunday and I'll think, oh man, there's nothing here. How am I going to preach on this? And by the end of the week, after I've prayed and after I've studied, I've got more stuff um, in the trash can that I'm not going to use than what I have time for um, in my message uh, the Bible is alive because we are born again. You know, philosophies come and philosophy, philosophies go, but the Word of God lasts forever. Um, men and women are still studying um, Socrates and Plato and, and the great philosophers of this world, and nothing really wrong with that. We ought to know our history. We ought to understand um, what these men and women um, have said and have taught, and if there's any truth in them, I say that that goes back to, to God. Um, but the Word of God is always going to be with us. Um, on Good Friday, or no, I guess it was uh, the, the Monday of um, Holy Week, um, I heard Rick Warren make a statement that was very interesting. He said that um, nations rise and nations fall. In other words, the United States is not going to be here forever. Certainly you and I won't be here forever, all right? But there's one thing that will last until the return of Jesus Christ, and that is the Word of God. And, Lord, and he is absolutely right on that. Now, the Word of God is alive because it is the written Word of the living God. If you want to know what God's will is for your life, just read the Word. Um, every word is... The Holy Spirit can take and, and will apply it to our life. We are to, to not just read this um, for the sake of coming to church, but we're to live our life by it. And it begins with picking it up and reading it, learning what it says, and learning to dig deep into its richness. Um, you'll never reach the bottom of God's Word um, it is greater than you and I combined, and, and it's, it's a joy to know that it's just as relevant today as it was 2,000 years ago or 3,500 years ago. Uh, the Word of God is alive, and if you apply your life to, to what it says, you will prosper, not necessarily financially, but your life will be better because you've been obedient to the Word of God. Let me remind you of what happened with Jesus. Shortly before the start of his ministry, uh, the Holy Spirit led him out into the wilderness, and he fasted for 40 days and 40 nights. 
Uh, yes, I believe that that actually happened. There's been some people, even in modern times, that have done that. It's an amazing uh, thing to, to think about. But at the end of those 40 days and 40 nights, the Holy Spirit, or not the Holy Spirit, but uh, Satan tempted him. Do you remember how Jesus responded to those temptations? Every single time he responded with the word of God. That's what we have to do. When we are tempted to sin, doesn't matter what the sin is, but when we are tempted, we should respond with the word of God. Now, I want you to notice, Jesus didn't have to run home and get his Bible out and turn to the index and look up the temptation and then uh, figure out what the verse is that applies. He had already hidden it in his heart. We should learn to, to read the Word of God daily. We should study the Word of God daily, but we should also memorize parts of the Word of God as best we can. If you have a problem sin, and we all do, go to the Word of God. Figure out what the Word of God teaches um, as God's will regarding your sin problem. And when the, the tempter comes along and entices you to sin, you'll have a weapon ready and you can quote that to him. Friends, the Word of God changes us. I've never met a person yet who has studied the Word of God for any length of time who's regretted it. The word can lower our blood pressure. It did with me. Um, it can help um, shape our outlook on life. It's done that with me. Um, it can change us. It does that with all of us who study the word of God. And I pray that you would be the kind of person that would get up every morning excited to get into the word of God and to study it. I want to close us with a word of prayer. Father, I thank you that your word is true. You have called us to live holy lives, lives of obedience and lives of faithfulness. Lord, walk with us each and every day. And when we surely will stumble, forgive us of our sins and help us not to live in those sins, but to walk in your holiness. In Jesus' name we pray.